Good morning. Welcome to all who came to worship today. Today is the fifth Sunday after Epiphany, and our lessons for today are going to show that Jesus is manifest as the Anointed One, who has the power to call us to be His messengers. Today we're going to be following the worship supplement to the order of service. We begin with our opening hymn, hymn 129, Hail, Thou Source of Every Blessing. God, 
our Heavenly Father has forgiven all of your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you the strength to live according to his will. Amen. Amen. With two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew. 
And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Here ends our first lesson. The psalm for this morning, Psalm 138, we see that God has the power to watch over and protect those he would call as his messengers. Psalm 138 as printed in the bulletin. Oh, Lord, for they have 
Corinthians is our sermon text. And in this section, we are going to see that um, because of God's great love for us, He has given us gifts. And the Corinthians love the gift of tongues, but Paul says that it's better to speak five words that people understand than a myriad of tongues which sound pretty, but people don't understand. We know the law. The gospel can only be understood if people speak it clearly. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, starting the second half of verse 12. Strive to excel in building up the church. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in a position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. Here ends our second lesson. Will the congregation please stand in reverence for the gospel? The Holy Gospel for this morning is taken from the fifth chapter of St. Luke. We begin reading at the first verse. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, the Master, we've toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken, and so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. <coughs> and Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching them. When they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it.
spoke. Join with me in confessing your Christian faith according to the Nicene Creed, page 5 in the Worship Supper. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for our sin and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Please be seated as we continue with the hymn of the day, uh, hymn 246, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
sermon text for this morning is the epistle appointed for today, 55. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 12 through 20. I'll just remind you of verse 15. I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. This is God's word. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God our Father, to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is the manifestation of the invisible God, my dear friends in Christ. Earworm. An earworm sounds like something that I would need to take my dog to the vet for. But that's not what an earworm is. The word earworm is slang for a song that you hear with the ear, but it worms its way into your brain and you end up singing that song all the rest of the day. Some of the popular earworms would be Baby Shark, doo -doo 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 -doo, or uh, This is the song that never ends. And when those words <coughs> get into your brain, you spend the rest of the day singing that stupid song. There was a time when um, I used to enjoy trying to plant those earworms into my family. My wife didn't like it a whole lot. But one of the happiest memories that I have from recent years is when I did that to my wife, but a couple hours later, my daughter was doing the dishes and humming that earworm. Now, she doesn't like doing dishes. Who does? But she doesn't really hate it. But there's just something about doing the dishes and coming that earworm that shows that even though she was doing the dishes, she was still happy. And doing the dishes doesn't take a whole lot of thought. Now granted, you have to be conscious, you have to be awake. You don't have to think a whole lot. And the same is true with that earworm. It's a song that usually it's just a couple of lines you sing over and over again. You're not really thinking about it. It's just there. That is a good description of tongues as mentioned in our text. Now, I wanted to study this text because I wanted to learn what exactly did Paul have in mind when he's talked about tongues in this chapter. And I'm going to be honest with you. We don't really know, and that's not where the sermon is going anyway. The sermon is going somewhere else. But, to lay the groundwork, what does Paul mean when he's talking about tongues? Up until the 16th century, up until about the time of Luther, everybody kind of assumed that the tongues that Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 14 were actual languages. Now, understand that in the temple, the scriptures were proclaimed in Hebrew. The liturgy was done in Hebrew. But most of the people didn't understand Hebrew. Most of the people spoke Aramaic or Greek. Now Paul's writing to the church at Corinth. And Corinth was trying very hard to be a Roman city. And so the people in Corinth used Latin. So, just understand this picture. The, the priests are speaking in Hebrew. The people are speaking Aramaic or Greek. Yet Corinth is trying to do Latin. We're talking about a melting pot of lots of different languages. And people, even up to Luther, thought that when the disciples were talking about tongues, they were talking about different languages. 
And as such, in a melting pot, a lot of times people would bring their own native languages, and then they'd try to learn the new language of worship and all that stuff, and sometimes they would still use their native language even if nobody else understood it. It was just a melting pot of different languages, and that's what people all the way up to about the time of Luther thought that Paul was talking about with tongues. <coughs> just talking in a different language. Understandable in the apostolic age. However, I remember hearing something, and I don't know where I heard it. I wish I'd have written it down, but I didn't. But I remember hearing somewhere that somebody did a study of the tongues being spoken today. And the study found out that today, when people speak in tongues, the average is about seven syllables. Seven syllables in a random order. And seven syllables is not a language. This idea developed around the 17th century, 18th century, in the 1700s when psychology started coming to the fore. Psychology started saying, I bet you these tongues were just an exciting burping out of syllables. They get so excited that they speak random gibberish. And that's part of the reason why I wanted to study this text, is to see, was there anything to this, or was this just excited psychobabble? But there are two things to remember. First of all, Paul himself said that he spoke in tongues. He so talked about how he was speaking, and praying, and singing praises in tongues. He doesn't try to stop them from using tongues. He acknowledges that this is a gift of the Spirit. And that it is productive. And another thing to remember, computers talk in binary. Two syllables. Yet it's still communication. So just because they say it's only seven syllables doesn't mean that it's not. And this is what the modern view thinks of tongues. Most of the time when charismatic churches today speak in tongues, they say they are talking the language of heaven. This is not an earthly language. This is what God and the angels speak. And maybe even the person saying the tongues doesn't know what he's saying. As Paul said, my mind is unfruitful. But he's just talking to God in God's own language. That's why I chose to study this text. Because I was curious which of those isn't. And I guess, I guess I'll just follow with that modern thinking that they think that it's the language of God, but uh, who really knows? What is important is that Paul says, I don't care if there's a myriad of tongues, 10,000 tongues. If people don't understand it, what good does it do? Paul says, I would rather speak five words using my mind, something that's understandable, than 10,000 words that sound pretty, but nobody understands. So this is where the rubber hits the road. What about right now? Do you enjoy understanding and really digging into scripture? Or would you rather worship be kind of like that earworm where you know what's going to be coming in and you just go through the motions and say what you're supposed to say, but you don't have to think too much about it? I understand that thinking is difficult. And some people by nature would rather not think. We'd rather just do what we're comfortable doing. But remember what Paul says. It's better to speak five words with the mind than 10,000 with the spirit that doesn't mean anything. Believe it or not, even Luther had to deal with this very issue. On this very text, he had to fight with Rome. Because the Church of Rome worshipped in Latin. But 
the German-speaking people didn't really understand Latin. So Luther wanted to make worship to where the people could understand it, but in so doing, the German language is not very pretty. And so they're going away from the beautiful Latin to German. And Luther says that the adversary had written pages and pages and pages where they jokingly said that people benefit even if they don't understand what it is that they're hearing. Is that true? Latin is a very beautiful language. Agnus Dei. Quitoris peccata mundi. Miserere nobis. Every language. It's even more beautiful when it's sung. I won't make it beautiful, but Agnus Dei. Quitoris peccata mundi. Miserere nobis. Isn't that beautiful? What does that mean? If you don't understand what it means, well then it's just sounds. And it might be comfortable sounds, pretty sounds, but that's not worship. But what if in not so pretty words, but rather uncomfortable words. I say, Lamb of God. The one who takes away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Maybe not so pretty. But what a picture comes to mind. That we sinners need the mercy of God and the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That builds up faith. Luther understood that it's more important for people to understand what's being said than to say the 10,000 words in a tongue which might be beautiful as the angels' voices themselves. But if people don't understand it, what good is it? The Lutheran Study Bible points out that we are prone to that same thing. We are prone to using 16th century Elizabethan English. Our Father, who art in heaven. You know, people don't really talk that way anymore. Four centuries, yes, that's the way people talk, but that's not the way we talk today. And a while back, in a different congregation, I encouraged us to go away from the Our Father and say the NIV version. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And the very first time we did that, after church, I had a lady come up to me and said, I don't like that new prayer. Now I have to think when I pray. He might have been complaining about that, but that's exactly what Paul wanted. I don't want you to come out here and have an earworm. Oh, Father, Lord, you can help me that game, that game, come on, whatever it sounds like today. We can do that. We can say the words and go through without even thinking about it. That's not worship. That's not doing any good. Paul says it's better to think about what you Yeah, pray with your spirit, but pray with your mind also. Not just the Our Father, the creeds, the hymns. If we are speaking a language that people don't understand, then how are we evangelizing them? How are we catching them? How are we spreading the good news? We might feel comfortable, but do they understand what we're saying? I'll be honest with you. There are some hymns that we sing, and some of those hymns have some words that I'm not even sure what I just sang. So should I say amen? 
At the end of a hymn, if I don't even know what I'm saying, should you? Speak five words in tune. Then 10,000 earworms going through the motion, but not really thought. The same LSB study Bible said that Paul is using rhetoric here. Five words, that's a round number, but just with rhetoric, right? Could five words be enough? Jesus sinners does receive. Four words. And yet those four words tell an amazing picture, do they not? Yes, we're sinful. We acknowledge that we're sinful, but Jesus sinners does receive. That's what Isaiah found in our first lesson. I am sinful. Yep. But guess what? Cleansed. Jesus, with Peter, get away from me, Lord, I'm sinful. Yes, you are, but guess what? I forgive you. And not only do I forgive you, I implore you, come work with me. Jesus, sinners, does receive. God loves me dearly. Me? Yes, me, a sinner. God loves me dearly. Five words? That's more than enough to give the gospel power of what the gospel really is. Sinners forgiven through Jesus. Sinners employed in the church. Sinners that have a message to share with the world who doesn't know it. I started this text because I was curious about tongues. What was the nature of tongues? But I found out that I myself have a tendency to do what's comfortable, go with what I'm used to, and not study using my mind and my heart. Once again, Paul says, I'm on the wrong page, I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing praise with my mind also. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. Somebody once pointed out that it's kind of funny when a two or three year old does something. Mommy, look! Daddy, look what I can do! They want all the attention. That's the way Corinth was. With their tongue speaking, they wanted all the attention to see what I can do. Don't be like a child. Rather, when it comes to evil, be innocent, be ignorant, don't know a thing about evil. But when it comes to thinking, be mature. How can we build up the church? Not about what makes me feel good, but what makes my mind and my heart praise God. What helps other people, both mind and heart, to praise God? We don't want earworms here. We want worship. God grant this to us. Amen. Paul ends 1 Corinthians with this blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you.
pray for all the saints of God and the people of Jesus according to their needs. O Lord God of hosts, build up your church and manifest your spirit among us with wisdom and knowledge. Let our words be measured and intelligible to our fellow Christians and to those outside your church, that we may utter our amens in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Sustain those called to be fishers of men in Christ's church, that they would not be discouraged when they toil all night and take nothing, but continue to let down their nets at his word according to that calling. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may be mature in our thinking and infants in evil. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bless all Christian homes that use your word, that your word would be sown and produce much fruit. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Give us faith to let down the nets of your word in our daily vocations, and trust your Son to do his gracious work through poor sinners like us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O oh God, be not far from us. As you have worked deeds of salvation in Christ Jesus, so make haste to help us now in every trouble. Give healing to the sick, strength to the weak, and comfort to the afflicted. Do not forsake us, nor the generations to come. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Send from your altar, O Lord, the body and blood of Christ. Cleanse us and our lips by this blessed sacrament, delivering the atonement Christ has won for us, that we may be worthy to stand before you now and at the last day. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O Lord, never depart from us. Though we are unworthy of you and your bounty, you are pleased to receive our meager thanks and reluctant obedience for the sake of Christ's perfect obedience. Let your word rule us and your spirit revive us to leave behind pride and anxiety alike that we may follow you in all we do. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Now, the gift that we have is um, Sing My Tongue, Glorious Battle. The, the words are printed for you in the worship bulletin. I'll ask Heidi to play it through one time before we sing it just so we know what the
lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. It is right and beneficial that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God. In the past, you spoke to us through the prophets. But in these last days, you have spoken to us by your Son, who is the radiance of your glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn.
Good morning once again. Welcome to Old King to Worship. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. More importantly, I hope you see that Jesus is the Christ and he has the authority to call us, yes, even us sinners, into his service. 